Hi everyone and welcome to this Friday meeting and today we have a special uh, meeting with two star guests in the field of thyroid cancer. We have Sophie Lepelo and Dr. Jim Fagan with us as uh, discussants. So Sophie Lebelou will present a phase two redifferentiation study using dabrafenib and trametinib in patients with metastatic radioiodine refractory BRAF mutated thyroid cancer. And immediately after her, Dr. Jim Fagan will join as a featured guest discussant. Following the discussion by Jim, we'll have an open discussion and you're all welcome to send questions. Dr. Sophie Lebelou is a board certified in endocrinology and nuclear medicine and oncology, so three specialties. And she's a renowned clinician and researcher in the field of thyroid cancer. She published with her team groundbreaking studies, including several publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, just to mention the estimable one and two studies. She worked in the Department of Nuclear Medicine and Endocrine Oncology in Wildwick, France, hope I'll say it correctly, for 20 years and joined the endocrine unit of the University Hospital of Geneva one year ago. Her, her research is focused on the role of adjuvant radioiodine treatment and on radioiodine refractory thyroid cancer. Dr. Jean Fagan is the head of the division of subspecialty medicine and a member of the human oncology and pathogenesis program at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He's a professor of medicine at the Well Cornell Medical College, and he's had a long and prosperous career, received prizes from the ATA, ETA, Endocrine Society, and has served as president of the ATA in 2012. His focus, uh, his research work focuses on understanding the pathogenesis and biology of thyroid cancers, has multiple research projects, including a leader in research of redifferentiation of thyroid cancer. It's a pleasure to have you both with us. And Sophie, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to present uh, the results of this study. Uh, as you said, a redifferentiation trial with the brefinib trametinib in iodine uh, metastatic um, refractory BRAF mediated uh, differentiated thyroid cancer. The, the study was just published uh, last month in the clinical cancer research. This is my financial disclosure uh, with boards. And the present study is an investigator initiated study. Uh, we had a grant from the French Ministry of Health. The dabrafenib and trametinib were provided by Novartis, and the recombinant human TSH was provided by Sanofi Genzyme, and the promotion of the study uh, was from Gustave Roussy. So it's been 20 years that we know that BRAF V600 imidation inhibits the expression of genes involved in the iodine metabolism. When we compare BRAF mediated papillary thyroid cancer to BRAF wild type, there is a decrease in the expression of NIS, of TPO, of thyroglobulin, and an increase in the GLUT1. Vince Fagan uh, has really nicely shown that uh, when you have a BRAF mutation, you have an activation of the uh, MAP kinase pathway, and there is a correlation between the MAP kinase pathway output and the differentiation score. And the idea is uh, to inhibit this MAP kinase uh, output to restore differentiation and to restore radioactive iodine avidity. So redifferentiation is the re-expression of genes involved in the iodine metabolism and the appearance or the reappearance of the iodine uptake. This is a picture from the pioneer study from the memorial um, by Alan Ho, uh, where you have an iodine 124 PET of a patient which is refractory and after six weeks of selumetinib, you have uptake in the lung and in the neck. From a biological point of view, this is the biopsy of a patient that had a, a BRAF K600 mutation. She was treated with dabrafenib trametinib. And after treatment, you see that uh, pathology changes. You have follicles, you have colloid, you have the expression of NIS, 
of thyroglobulin and of anti-TPO. There has been several redifferentiation prospective trials in BRAF V600 e mediated uh, cancer. The first one uh, by Alan Ho is selimetinib on nine patients. He showed with the iodine 124 PET that there was an increase in the iodine uptake in 44% of the patients. The increase was sufficient uh, to do a treatment with radioactive iodine. And these patients had a partial response, which gives a 11% best partial response. Then you had a study in 2015 with dabrafenib on 10 patients. The increase in the iodine uptake was present in 60% of the cases which were treated with iodine and the best partial response rate was 20%. In 2018, a, a trial with vimurafenib on 12 patients, the increase in the iodine uptake was present in 40% of the cases which were treated and the partial response rate was 25%. Then there is this trial with a combination of vimurafenib and an antibody against herb B3. The increase of iodine uptake was much higher, 83%. Five of the patients were treated with radioactive iodine and the partial response rate was 40%. Finally, the same year, uh, six patients treated with dabrafenib and tramitinib um, for three weeks. The increase in the iodine uptake was 33% and the partial response rate was 17%. We, we did the Mihayat study in 2015, and this is the design uh, we made. Patient had an initial workup with a brain MRI. They all had a baseline diagnostic whole body scan with five millicuries. They had a whole body CT scan without IV contrast, thyroglobulin measurement, FDG PET. Then they had dabrafenib at a dose of 150 milligrams twice a day, and trametinib at a dose of two milligrams per day for a total of 42 days. After four weeks, the patients had a whole body scan without IV contrast, thyroglobulin measurement. They had a second uh, diagnostic whole body scan at day 28 with five millicuries. And whatever the results of this scan was, all patients were treated with a high activity of iodine, 150 millicuries after thyrogen. They all had a post-therapeutic whole body scan. And then they had follow-up with a neck uh, and chest uh, abdominal pelvic CT scan with IV injection, TG measurements, and FDG PET CT at six months. What is important to say is that in case of partial response at six or 12 months, according to the local assessment, a second course of treatment with dabrafenib, trametinib, and radioactive iodine uh, could be given. This is the main inclusion criteria. Patients were above the age of 18 years. Uh, they had, of course, a BRAF a V600 E mutation. They were radioactive iodine refractory based on the presence of distant MET without iodine uptake on the post therapeutic whole body scan and or distant MET with resist progression within 12 months uh, of a therapeutic whole, uh, iodine administration. They all had measurable lesions, but no lesions larger than three centimeters and they all had resist progression within 18 months prior to the enrollment. This is the, uh, the, the flow diagram. We had 26 patients registered and 24 patients with, were included. The 24 patients started dabrafenib and trametinib. Two patients uh, were put out of the study. One stopped the dabrafenib trametinib because of toxicity and one stopped because the CT scan at day 28 was performed with uh, uh, iodine contrast uh, administration. The 22 patients received uh, the iodine 150 millicuries, but one patient was also excluded because he had a CT scan with IV injection. So at least 21 patients having a first course of treatment with a follow-up at one, three, and six months. Among them, 10 of them did not have tumor response um, and were, did not receive a second course of uh, dabrafenib trametinib, and then they were followed with CT scan at 12 and 18 months. And 11 patients uh, did have a response and they had a second course of dabrafenib trametinib. One stopped because of COVID uh, pandemic, so we had 10 patients uh, that 
did have the second course of treatment. This is the characteristics of the patients. The mean age was 67 years, mostly we are women. The uh, local pathology uh, results were papillary thyroid cancer in all cases. The central review showed total cell variant of PTC in 17 cases, classic PTC in two cases, columnar cell in one case, poorly differentiated in one case, and in three cases, we did not have a central review. When we look uh, also at still at the characteristics, the number of prior iodine administration, the mean number was 2.3, going from one to four. The mean cumulated activity of iodine one was 8.11 gigabitrel, which is about 250 millicuries. There was only one patient that had been previously treated with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So we had 95% of, of the patients treated as first line but patients uh, had local treatments such as external beam radiation in one third of the cases, local treatment for lung meds in 12%, local treatment for bone meds in 8% of the cases. And most of the patients were ECOG zero. This is the result of the rate of patients with abnormal iodine uptake. We had 5% of the patients with abnormal initial diagnostic whole body scan. 65% at day 28 had an abnormal whole body scan, and 95% had abnormal whole body scan on the post therapeutic uh, scan. So we had six patients without disease with iodine uptake at day 28, which did disclose abnormal uptake on the post treatment whole body scan. And this is an example of a baseline uh, diagnostic whole body scan with. Uh, besides one uptake in the neck, nothing in the lung. Of course, at day 28, uh, it was uh, really high. We had already had a high uptake, and also we had it on the post therapeutic whole body scan. If you look at the tumor response, uh, according to the RESIST uh, criteria, with a central review of uh, the CT scan, at one month, the objective response rate was 48% with all the response rate being partial response. At three months, the objective response rate was 57%, with all of the response being partial response. And at six months, the response rate was 38%, so all partial response uh, uh, and no complete response in none of the cases. And this is the wonderful plot of the six months resist evaluation after the first cure uh, with one progression, stable di disease and, uh, and partial response. When we also had a persist uh, evaluation with a central review according to the persist criteria and among the 20 patients in which it was available, the response rate was 65% uh, with no complete response and only partial response. I told you that uh, uh, 10 patients had uh, just one course of treatment, so they were followed at 12 and 18 months. So the objective response rate at 12 months was 10%. It was one partial response and otherwise stable disease. At 18 months, we still had one patient with partial response, so it's an objective response rate of 10%. Now we also had the 11 patients that did receive a second course of treatment with dabrafenib, trametinib, and iodine-131. And this is the response rate, uh, one month, three months, six months, 12 months, and 18 months after the second course of treatment. But the baseline was still the inclusion of the patient in the phase two trial. So at one month, we had an objective response rate of 90% with a complete response rate of 10% and partial response of 80%. At three months, it was similar, a complete response rate of 10% and partial response rate of 80%. At six months, the objective response rate was 70% with a complete response rate of 10% and partial response rate of 60%. At 12 months, the objective response rate decreased to 40% because of a decreasing in the partial response rate to 30%, and we still had the complete response. 
And I, 18 months, it was similar to the 12 months evaluation. When we look at the evolution of the sum of the target lesions, this is for the patients, the 10 patients that only had one course of treatment. Um, you have in gray the treatment uh, with the brefinib, trametinib, and you can see that even prior the start of the prior the iodine administration, we had a decrease in the size of the lesions, and after uh, the lesions either uh, continue to decrease or uh, were stable. When we look at the patients that had the two treatment curses, uh, here in gray, here and here, so you also had a decrease in the size of the lesions than before the iodine administration, that in mostly stayed stable, went back down uh, during the second course of treatment, and then in some cases remained stable and it other increased. If you look at longer term uh, results, looking at the PFS, uh, we, after a median follow-up of 13 months, we had one death which was thyroid cancer related. And the 12 month PFS rate, according to the central resist evaluation was 82%. The 24 PFS rate was 68% with the median PFS, which was not reached. We did a post hoc analysis looking at the time without retreatment. So the median time without retreatment was 39.6 months with a 12 month retreatment rate of 9.5% and a 24 month retreatment, retreatment rate of 28%. Uh, None of the patients developed a D differentiation with anaplastic transformation or another primary malignancy during the follow up. If you look at the safety, we had 96% of the patients that experienced at least one adverse event. Most were grade one in 25% of the cases and grade two in 42%. Nine, nine grade three adverse events occurred in six patients and one grade four. The grade four was an anicteric cholestasis uh, in one patient. And the grade three were asthenia, nausea, as that increased hypertension, Neutropia, an infectious syndrome, and a psoas hematoma. We evaluated the quality of life uh, with a QLQC30 questionnaire at inclusion at day 14, day 28, day 42, and at three and six months after the first treatment course. And clearly, we had a deterioration, the deterioration of the scores from baseline to the end of treatment, day 42 which were reversible with scores raising again after the end of treatment until the six months of follow-up. So we had a decrease in the global health status and you can see it here with a decrease, which is uh, uh, most important uh, after 42 days and then it comes back to normal. And we had a deterioration of four of the five dimensions that is explored by the questionnaire. We had a deterioration of the physical functioning the rural functioning, the cognitive functioning, and the social functioning. And we had more than 40% of the patients that had a clinically significant quality of life deterioration. The questionnaire also uh, gives uh, scores for eight symptoms, and we had a decrease uh, alteration of the symptoms, mostly for fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, appetite loss, in about half of the patients. And we had the same pattern that for the quality of life, we have a decrease during the uh, treatment, which was reversible and came back to normal afterwards. We searched for predictive factors of the six month resist uh, tumor response. So we tried to look whether the one month resist was predictive or not of the six months resist. So among the 10 patients that had a one month response resist, Five of them had a six month resist response, so it's 50%. And among the 11 patients that did not have a one month resist response, three of them did have a six month resist. So the, the difference is not sig statistically significant. We also looked at the abnormal uptake on the second diagnostic whole body scan. 
So when you had no abnormal uptake on the diagnostic two whole body scan, uh, we had tumor response at six months in 33% of the cases. And when you had abnormal uptake on the diagnostic two whole body scan, you had six month resist tumor response uh, in 37% of the cases. So a difference uh, which was not statistically significant. We also looked at the, at the intensity of the baseline FDG uptake. So when the SGB max was above uh, 15, uh, we had 40% of the patients having a six month resist response and it was less than 15, it was 30%. So it was also not predictive. We had a tissue genotyping analysis with 14 tissue samples available for an NGS genotyping. We had an uncombined tumor mutation load ESA with 409 genes covered. Among them, seven uh, were related to the Swiss SNF pathway. So the tumor mutational load ranked from 0.8 to 11.3 mutations per megabase. We found a BRAF mutation in all cases. Uh, we found seven third promoter mutation, and there were three additional mutations classified as pathological variant uh, in the HNF1A, TRIP11, and SMOC A4. The last one uh, is uh, involved in the swift NIF pathway, and the three patients uh, did have a six months uh, resist re partial response. We also had variant of unknown significance. In we had fourteen of them, four of them are being involved uh, in the swift uh, sniff pathway, and we had partial response uh, in those patients. Of course, uh, many limitations in the study. It is a small number of patients that were enrolled. We had a central imaging review performed at the end of the study, whereas the treatment decisions were based on local assessment. We did not have biopsy on the distant met just prior treatment initiation and four weeks after the dabrafenib trametinib, uh, which would have been really interesting. We had a decrease in tumor size prior to the administration of the iodine, uh, which brings the question of the respective role of each of the treatment. And we have not been uh, able to, to make the difference between the treatments. But still, we can have we can do some conclusions uh, in the population study, which I, I, I just want you to, to keep in mind. They were all refractory. They had a relatively low tumor burden with no lesions above three centimeters. They were progressive within 18 months. We showed them that the association of the brefenib, trametinib and uh, was was able to restore the iodine uptake in 95% of the cases. We have um, a significant rate of long lasting tumor responses. We had 38% response rate at six months, but the, re the, but the best response rate was at three months being uh, more than 50%. The 12 month PFA um, rate was at 12 months was 82% and at 24 months, it was 68%. We had no anaplastic transformation observed, and we did not find any predictive factor of tumor response or of tumor resistance to uh, redifferentiation, whether a diagnostic whole body scan, molecular alteration, or FDG uptake. Uh, with that, I wanted to thank the, the patients, the investigators of the Mihaya trial, the TTRF networks, I wanted to thank you to your attention, and uh, I think this is uh, open for discussion. Thank you, Sophie. Now, Jim, the stage is yours. We'll have a discussion afterwards. And again, you're welcome to send questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, you know, after this really interesting study uh, that, that, that definitely advances the field, um, you know, add some new information that actually sort of uh, asked us to revisit some of the prior concepts. So I, I will try and go through some of these thoughts uh, briefly. So I thought we should just cover uh, what we know and what we don't about redifferentiation therapies. And maybe to begin that conversation, uh, we should discuss 
first who responds and who does not to conventional radioactive iodine therapy. Um, so based on the uh, ATA guidelines for uh, treatment of patients with thyroid cancer um, and the current recommendations about uh, in which patients we should consider radioactive iodine, uh, there is no categorical recommendation for radioactive iodine based on uh, uh, you know, what's considered high quality evidence of most of these uh, recommendations are to consider radioactive iodine. I just highlighted here in red the uh, 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 characteristics that are commonly associated with BRAF tumors, since this, that's the topic of our conversation today. And as you can see, in patients with intermediate risk thyroid cancer, many of the histological features. Uh, that actually prompt patients, uh, prompt uh, physicians to consider radioactive iodine are those that we see enriched in patients with BRAF mutant thyroid cancer, such as, you know, uh, 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 parathyroidal invasion, uh, presence of significant uh, uh, numerous or bulky lymph nodes, or uh, uh, BRAF mutant uh, thyroid cancers, of course. And the same is true for patients with high risk thyroid cancer, with gross extrathyroid extension or incomplete resections or extensive nodal disease. All of these are characteristics of BRAF mutant tumors, not exclusively, of course. There are a number of fusion-driven cancers that can have similar characteristics, uh, but I, I think this is one you know, important uh, uh, issue to bear in mind. Why do we worry about this? And this is a slide I'm sure many of you have seen in one form or another many times, and it relates to the data from the TCGA study of thyroid cancer. Um, and uh, what you're looking at here are the, uh, is the association between uh, mutations uh, of various effectors in the MAP kinase pathway, the BRAF mutant cancers being here at the top. Uh, I'm just having some difficulty advancing this. Here we go. Uh, and uh, as you can see, roughly in this uh, TCGA study, uh, close to 60% of patients had BRAF mutant cancers. And if you look at the transcriptomic data, the expression of thyroid differentiation genes was decreased, as, as Sophie just mentioned, uh, in the majority of these BRAF mutant tumors. However, uh, uh, this is not the case for all of them. So uh, there was a subset of uh, BRAF mutant thyroid cancers that had relative retained expression of at least some markers of thyroid differentiation. Um, I, 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 I would want to point out though, that of course, in all these cases, these uh, uh, tumor samples were drawn or removed from patients who presumably were mostly euthyroid and had uh, normal TSH levels, whereas normally uh, radioactive iodine is administered in patients who have uh, uh, been exposed to exogenous uh, thyrogen or uh, in some cases have, be have become hypothyroid. So uh, whether these gene expression changes would be the same in a TSH uh, stimulated state uh, is something that is uh, more uncertain. Uh, however, what do we know about this subgroup of uh, BRAF and thyroid cancers that retain differentiation? Uh, Laura Bukai uh, at our institution looked at that question. Um, and uh, when she looked at those uh, BRAF and thyroid cancers and compares those that, those that had a high thyroid differentiation score with those that had a low thyroid differentiation score, what she found was that those BRAF uh, thyroid cancers that retained uh, some degree of thyroid differentiation were enriched for uh, patients with relatively small tumors, uh, uh, either T1 or T2, uh, that either lacked nodal metastases or had you know, mostly central compartment uh, nodal metastases, uh, and that were most, mostly did not have distant metastatic disease. Uh, these are the types of patients that would be pathological stage one and two that are uh, have been studied by Sophie's group in the estimable two study, and that do not appear to benefit from adjuvant radioactive iron therapy anyway. So uh, I would assume that uh, even this subset of BRAF mutant thyroid cancers, the response to re conventional radioactive iodine therapy, uh, uh, at least in the adjuvant setting, uh, is modest at best. Um, and this is sort of illustrated as well uh, 
uh, in this slide, also from the TCGA study, which actually uh, uh, associates the thorough differentiation score with the BRAF, RAS, with the BRAF score, with the higher scores uh, being associated uh, with uh, uh, tumors that are uh, more RAS-like and the uh, lower sc the TDS score and, and the lower BRAF score being associated with the BRAF-like tumors. And if you just look at the tumors that had a high thyroid differentiation score, the BRAF high TDS, meaning a TDS greater than zero, uh, most of these uh, were actually in the generally lower range of the uh, positive TDS, uh, with a minority of them being associated with a TDS comparable to RAS mutant tumors. So, uh, since it is so difficult to assess response to conventional radioactive iodine in the adjuvant setting, because we really have uh, no rigorous way to know whether a response to therapy is due to the adequacy of the surgery or the, how comprehensive the surgery has been uh, uh, versus whether the radioactive iodine added to that effect. So one way of looking at that question would be how often do we see responses to radioactive iodine therapy in patients who have uh, uh, distant metastases? And uh, again, Laura Bukai was involved in uh, looking at that question by going into the data line of the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, uh, you know, patient population, finding those that had been treated with radioactive iodine over a uh, more than three decade period, uh, and uh, of the, we eliminated those patients that had undetectable, that had detectable thyroglobulin antibodies so that we could use thyroglobulin as a classifier. And we looked at those patients who had a thyroglobulin greater than 200 at any course in their evolution, uh, making the assumption that these were uh, likely to be enriched for distant metastatic disease. Uh, we found a small minority that uh, met that criteria. And then we looked at the nadir thyroglobulin after radioiodine therapy, and specifically those patients that had a nadir that was less than 20 nanograms per milliliter. There were only 34 patients. And we were able to identify 11 of those that uh, when we measured uh, their distant metastatic lesions had a resist version 1.1 response to radioiodine therapy. So, uh, ultimately, we were able to consent to eight patients, uh, five of these arising from this screen and others uh, that we obtained either from collaborators at other institutions uh, or from anecdotal experience at our own institution that had not been captured by the data line. And they were, you know, uh, uh, what we did is with a case control uh, and match these uh, except what we call exceptional responders to non-responders, and they were matched based on their histopathology. Um, and, uh, uh, and as you can see here, based on the demographics, uh, they were quite comparable in terms of age, although the non-responders had more males than females, uh, 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 which was the opposite of what was seen in the exceptional responders, did not reach statistical significance, but it was a, a significant trend. Um, and of course, as you might expect, those exceptional responders uh, uh, actually had a greater decrease in thyroglobulin level, uh, than the, uh, uh, and whereas those that did not respond had a progressive uh, increment in TG over time. Their cumulative doses uh, of radioactive iron received were not different. Uh, and if you look at the overall uh, median time to disease progression, uh, it was actually more prolonged in those patients who did have responses than those that did not. I'm not going to go through this in any detail. These are just examples of demonstrating the structural responses in some of these patients. And if you just look again at the progression-free survival uh, in exceptional responders versus non-responders in blue, uh, they are quite uh, different, uh, as was also true for disease-specific survival, although this was not statistically different. So uh, the core uh, aspect of this work is looking at their genotype differences. And, uh, and note that there were no BRAF V600E mutations in those patients that responded exceptionally to radioactive iodine. They did have 
class 2 BRAF mutations. These actually mutations are signal in a RAS-like manner. So they actually require RAF dimerization to signal. They're more responsive for negative feedback. So the output of the MAP kinase pathway is lower. And they were also enriched for RAS mutations and fusion events. No difference in the frequency of TERP promoter mutations. And uh, by contrast, in the non-responders, there were more BRAF E600E mutations. Uh, and we did see more mutations in epigenetic uh, uh, modifiers. And uh, so this brings to mind uh, the interesting data that Sophie showed today, uh, which showed that several of the patients that had partial responses to the brafnib trametinib uh, induced redifferentiation had SWISNF complex mutations. And this uh, is, uh, you know, in contrast to some preclinical data we published a couple of years ago where we showed in mouse models that uh, deletion uh, of uh, components or, or subunits of this chromatin modifier complex uh, locked cells in a uh, uh, dedifferentiated state that could not be reversed by MAP kinase inhibition. Uh, and, uh, and then in the clinical trials, a, a retrospective look at our own redifferentiation studies uh, what we had found is that in patients who had not responded to those redifferentiation studies, we had identified mutations in SMARGB1, ARID1A, and ARID2 as being associated with lack of response, whereas uh, we had found no cases with SWISNF mutations that had responded, which is in contrast to uh, 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 the data that you just saw from Sophie, and I think tells us that we should have no categorical exclusion based on this uh, of patients who have a SWISNF mutation, particularly if it's a missense mutation, uh, uh, that uh, we should automatically consider that they are not a candidate for redifferentiation study so that, uh, again, we could not make a categorical recommendation in that regard uh, based on the new data. Now, one of the most interesting findings of uh, this study on exceptional responders uh, was uh, uh, seen in, when we looked at the uh, copy number abnormalities. And shown in red here are the exceptional responders. You can see they are largely copy number quiet, whereas those uh, patients who are non-responders, again, most of them, again, have few copy numbers. Remember, most of these are differentiated thyroid cancers. But one thing that they had that was strikingly different was 1Q amplification, which was found uniquely in patients who did not respond to radioactive iodine. And that was uh, markedly uh, significant as illustrated here in this right panel with patients with 1Q gain being enriched in the non-responder population and not found at all in the exceptional responders. Whereas other copy abnormalities that are common in thyroid cancer, such as 22Q loss, did not distinguish uh, between one and the other. I'm not going to go through this in detail because it is rather self-evident that those patients who had exceptional responders had a higher thyroid differentiation score, whereas those that did not respond had a lower score. Uh, the same was true in the trend of the BRAF score, which was RAS-like in the responders, BRAF-like in the non-responders. And there was a very tight correlation uh, between BRAF score, BRAF-RAS score, sorry, and, and, and the TDS score. Uh, I'm going to skip over this uh, just to point out that when we looked at the Cancer Genome Atlas study and looked at the patients with 1Q amplification, what we found is that indeed they do have a lower TDS score. And this is within the BRAF cohort. So if you look at the BRAF cohort that are copy number quiet, the average TDS score is roughly minus 0.5 whereas in the, those that also have a 1Q amplification, it's uh, uh, less than uh, minus one. And uh, when we look at the transcriptomic analysis of what might explain this, and again, I'm going to move through this quickly because uh, I would like to leave time for discussion. Uh, I just would like to point out that those uh, samples that had 1Q amplification uh, had a more uh, progenitor-like transcriptional uh, score, meaning that they uh, were more primitive cells that also were enriched for a, a, a expression of a, a PRC2, which is the polychrome repressor complex, which tends to make chromatin more compact and prevent differentiation. Uh, 
So it's an association with 1Q amplification, uh, but we don't specifically have an individual gene or genes that we can uh, point to causing this. So in terms then of patients who respond to conventional reductive iodine, uh, looking now just at those with metastatic disease, those that do respond are enriched for uh, constitutively active mutations that, uh, that activate the kinase pathway through RAF dimerization. And I bring that up because it is the presence of RAF dimers that allows negative feedback to shut off the pathway. And so which are these mutations? RAS mutations, class 2B RAF mutations, and RTK fusions. And also they are usually diploid and lack 1Q amplification. And the opposite is true for those tumors that are RAI refractory. And rich would be RAF mutations, have frequent chromosome 1Q amplification, have lesions in the PF3 kinase pathway, splicing regulation, and chromatin remodeling pathways, at least in the conventional setting. But uh, in view of the data that Sophie showed today, uh, we should probably be a little bit more uh, circumspect about making any firm recommendations about this, certainly for missense mutations. Uh, but if you do have, say, a frame shift or a null mutation of a, a key uh, uh, subunit of the slice sniff complex, such as smart B1, I, I would be skeptical that that patient would likely uh, would be likely to respond to reactive iodine in, in any form. So what is the, the rationale for redifferentiation therapy? I think Sophie covered this. I'm going to move through it quickly. You've seen a slide along these lines. This is more updated uh, and relates to this reciprocal relationship between the MAP kinase uh, uh, transcriptional output and thorough differentiation. Uh, we, we learned about this relationship in part through in vitro experiments that had been done a number of years ago, actually beginning from work done in Italy by uh, the group of, of uh, Roberto Di Laro, Alfredo Fusco, and Massimo Santoro, who had begin, began looking at this question in the, question of, in the setting of overexpression of RAS and an and impact on uh, silencing of thyroglobulin gene expression. Uh, but we built on that, and, and then this was an example in a mouse model of conditional BRAF activation, where when we switched on BRAF, we decreased iodine uptake. When we switched it off, we could re restore it, and, and we could do the same with either MEK or RAF inhibitors. And just to give at least a sense of what we know of the signaling pathways that might explain this, the bottom line is that there is a reciprocal relationship between the activation of the RAS, BRAF signaling pathway and the activation of TSH receptor-driven differentiation through psychic AMP signaling in such a way that when you have the activation of the uh, ERK signaling pathway, it suppresses the expression. I apologize. It looks like the slide was corrupted. Uh, suppresses the, the expression of thorough differentiation, uh, transcription factors, uh, and, 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 and the gene expression, but it also uh, suppresses the uh, expression of TSHR uh, and blocks the ability of adenylate cyclists to generate psychic AMP. So, uh, so there are multiple points of interference by MAP kinase activation of the signaling of TSHR downstream uh, to induce thyroid differentiation. And is this sort of interaction, this reciprocal relationship that is the underpinning of why if we block this pathway, at least in some cases, we can restore uh, the ability to, of TSH to signal downstream to activate gene expression. So then which patients are potential candidates for redifferentiation uh, treatments? And I would like to highlight that at least we continue to think of this as an experimental therapy um, and uh, it is not FDA approved. Uh, it is not yet compendium approved in the United States either. Uh, I'd be interested to see uh, in the discussion what people are doing in their practices, what Sophie may be doing off-label, uh, and uh, uh, so in which patients then uh, should we consider this? Well, in patients with locally recurrent or metastatic thyroid cancer, of course, uh, that has not responded to conventional therapies, it's really critical to select drugs based on tumor genotype. Um, the brafenib and trametinib, or combination of RAF and MEK inhibitors, is a logical choice for BRAF mutant tumors. Um, I would like to uh, at least raise the possibility that 
an, an alternative way of maybe drugging this pathway in a way to uh, bypass the relief of negative uh, of feedback uh, is by the combination of treatment with a, a RAF inhibitor and a HER2 or HER3 inhibitor, which is the pathway that gets reactivated uh, uh, in response to uh, RAF kinase inhibition. Uh, and that in, at least in a very small pilot study than our institution suggests that actually could result in uh, uh, robust responses. Now, uh, in terms of FDG-PET, at least in our experience, those patients who had higher FDG-PET activity were less likely to respond to redifferentiation. Uh, in our series as well, it was, th it was those patients who had a greater degree of thyroglobulin elevation as opposed to those mutant cancers, uh, metastatic cancers, uh, that we know structurally have uh, thyroid cancer metastases, and yet the thyroglobulin levels are relatively modest. They tend to uh, redifferentiate less eff effectively in our experience. And as I mentioned, I won't rediscuss the swi sniff mutations because I should uh, uh, now qualify that information. But uh, for instance, we so in terms of factors that can predict for insensitivity, I think that remains to be seen in larger studies to get more definitive uh, data. So I think, uh, again, just to highlight that, at least from our perspective, we consider this to be experimental. Uh, I find it reassuring uh, that the PFS in, in, in Sophie's study was actually quite uh, promising and that no patients actually uh, transitioned to uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer, which has been uh, one concern that we can discuss. Um, and I think I'll stop here and, and let Al uh, moderate the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Sophie and Jim, for wonderful presentations. And now we'll have a Q&A session. I'm Al Robinstock. We also have uh, Mark Irfin with us. And we'll start with two questions from uh, the audience. So first, uh, from Juan Antonio Vallejo Casas, if I say the, the name right, so do you think that this is an alternative option at the time when you think of TKIs? So when you see progression, you're thinking of giving a systemic therapy and would you give this therapy at that time or at an earlier time point? Uh, Sophie, what do you think? We don't hear. The, uh, yeah, now you hear? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I still think that uh, most probably patients with really big lesions um, will respond less than patients with small lesions. So I, I would put it in an early treatment, uh, but still have patients that have that are resist progressive. What I mean is that if you wait until you have three, four, five centimeter lesions, uh, the risk is that the iodine will not be as efficient because we know that uh, it's, it's better efficient in small lesions. But given the toxicity and given the low number of patients that have been included so far, I would reserve the, the treatment to patients that do have resist progression, not the patients that have stable disease and not the patients that have uh, less than 10 millimeters lesions. So you would use a 10 millimeter threshold? Do you think it's well, reasonable? I, I would use the resist criteria. Okay. But if there are large lesions, so you would think these patients are less likely to respond. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have the proof, but uh, uh, yes, I think they would be less likely to respond. Jim, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I mean, we use a similar uh, criteria. Uh, I don't think we require sort of uh, a, a resist degree of progression in order to treat these patients with relatively small lesions. But if we're seeing patients with distant metastases that I agree are relatively small, not particularly FDG avid, where we're seeing rising thyroglobulins and even modest changes over time in terms of just growing by a few millimeters and their lung lesions. It's not that we strictly require them. And of course, for, for uh, 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 clinical trials, that's different because there are specific criteria, but 
uh, in practice for the few cases where we are applying this information, we're doing it uh, in the same context that Sophie mentioned, but you know, evidence of progressive disease, not if it's perfectly stable. Yeah. Okay, we have another question from Uri Oer from Israel. So did you check changes in entire global in levels as predictors for redifferentiation? So to predict response. No, we, we, we don't have the data because um, uh, in the in the study design we had, we, so at four weeks we had a um, stimulated, we had a second diagnostic whole body scan. And in some patients we had a TG level at four weeks performed after the stimulation in other patients prior to the stimulation. So that the rise of paraglobulin under uh, the brafenib trametinib in our study was not, uh, we, we couldn't use it. Okay. It's interesting that we focus on patients with BRAF mutation. Maybe when we understand this uh, pathway better, what about patients with RAS type mutations? How do you see the options that we have there, Jean? Well, I mean, as you know, the first study, which was a salimentinib study, showed particular promise in the context of RAS mutant tumors. And so right now, I mean, we have the problem of drugging RAS, and that's uh, uh, if, it would be nice if we had KRAS G12C mutations in thyroid cancer where we have specific drugs that can block that particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, G protein. But uh, so far, not in RASQ61R, which is what we would love to have. Um, and there's a smattering of mutations of uh, at, at other sites. So we can't drug RAS itself. Uh, so we we're left with its downstream effectors. And of those, MEC is the top one. Uh, there are still studies that need to be reported, but I mean, uh, uh, the trametinib study that uh, Sophie has done, there's one that Alan Ho has done, that show some, I would say, responses that are along the lines of what you just heard, maybe a little bit better. Um, and uh, so uh, that is the context where we can use it. And of course, many of those patients already with rasputin tumors may even have a baseline degree of RAI avidity that we often do not see in the BRAF context, right? So you're augmenting uh, some degree of uptake that might even exist at baseline. Uh, so I think there's sort of, uh, uh, that would be the most rational step at this point, but Sophie probably has other thoughts. No, I mean, I mean, for the rest mutation, um, uh, the, the, the key is the drug. <laughs> Mm -hmm. the, the key is the drug. Uh, I think that our result with trametinib were not as good as yours. Um, but uh, I mean, RAS mutation is tricky. We have, we have troubles for the drug. It's a resistance pathway after BRAF or after uh, other drug in, in, in oncology. So clearly RAS mutation are, are really hard to, to hit. Yeah. Mark, and and I think that, question? yeah. I think that we focused on BRAF because it's also the most frequent and uh, it's um, mutation. Okay. Mark, do you have a question? Is this... We don't hear you. Mark, we don't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, outstanding presentations, uh, Sophie and Jim, and thank you. I, I My question, um, I for Sophie is what is, what is the next step um, from an uh, um, investigative perspective here? Uh, where, where do we go um, uh, for um, these uh, radioiodine resistant tumors in your mind? I mean, the, 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 the difficult thing is, is more like, how can we do with the pharmaceutical companies? Uh, because, um, they don't want to, to do trials uh, with anti-BRAF, anti-MEC. Uh, if, if we could, we, would, we, we could do a trial. We, I mean, the ideas are there. We, we, could, we could run trial of Dabra Trame against Dabra Trame plus iodine. I mean, there are many things. The problem is that anti-BRAF and anti-MEC drugs are not given by the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Okay, we have two more questions so, so, from the audience. Yeah. yeah. 
so, so the main yeah. trouble is that uh, it, it, it's being used out of trials. Right. right. And, and this, it, it can underserve the, the treatment. I mean, I mean, if you don't pick up the right patients, you're, gonna have, you're not going to have a treatment that is efficient and it might be put on, on the side, whereas I'm sure that some patients would really benefit from the treatment. Right. Yeah, if I could comment, I feel the same way. And that's why I mentioned that it's, uh, you know, I emphasize that it's experimental because I worry that its widespread use in an uncritical way uh, could actually be counterproductive. I mean, uh, for the centers that have been working in this, and it's not that we just feel that it only needs to belong to those centers, because I think there's a limit to the number of, of trials that we could do now, right now, or, because the proof of concept is out there. And a definitive study uh, would have to be a larger one. Uh, uh, there's been a, a, a lot of discussion with, within ITOG about you know, what shape such a study should uh, take and what would be the design of it. Um, but, but at least if we just follow some of the recommendations that Sophie mentioned and uh, that I would agree with in terms of what is the subset of patients that are candidates for this, uh, if it is going to be used in practice, uh, then we should confine it to those patients at this point. Um, I, I think that's that that's the important message. Um, I don't know, Sophia, if you consider FDG PET as a consideration if you have a patient who has, say, very high FDG PET levels. And I have one more question uh, for Sophia, if I could just uh, break in. Uh, is I noticed there was... Uh, uh, there are two aspects of your study that I thought were interesting. One is that your patients were enriched for tall cell variant of papillary. And based on you know, new data now from a few groups, it appears that the presence of mitochondrial complex one mutations, very similar to those that are seen in Hertha cell cancer, are what distinguishes BRAF uh, tall cell variants from BRAF classical tumors. So maybe there is a, uh, a this remains to be confirmed, I, I should say, mm -hmm. like a genetic difference and a functional difference in that these are metabolically distinct uh, uh, lesions. Whether that affects their ability to respond or not, I don't know, but you would expect that a complex one mutation tumor would be FDG, FDG pet higher, right? So, uh, so these are just loose thoughts right now. But I wonder whether that contributed to some of uh, the characteristics of your population. And the second question relates to something that I've been advocating for for a long time is that we should do a study where we give a second treatment. And I think what you're showing is that that second line of treatment didn't help very much. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the second question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we've been really disappointed by the second, by the second set of treatment. Uh, uh, clearly, I didn't present it there, but uh, the, the uptake of on, on the post therapeutic whole kind of the second treatment was really not very good, and uh, um, it was really disappointing. My, my fear is that the, with the first treatment, we 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 differentiate part of the cells and we kill them, and then it stays. We, we, we put in place the one that are resistant <laughs> to the to the redifferentiation, but it's just just a hypothesis. Uh, I don't say, I, I don't know. But I, I I in the light of this, I cannot say that repeated treatment are is a good thing. And okay. and for the first question uh, regarding tall cell, yeah, I mean I mean it's it's interesting. It's also interesting that. Um, all cell probably might be underdiagnosed because uh, we, we didn't expect to have that much tall cell uh, with a central review of the pathology. Maybe this is the reason why we do not find FDG PET as a prognostic factor, uh, which would help me to understand why. I think we are the only one to, to say that FDG is not predictive. So, so I, I take the, the hypothesis. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We have, we have three. We're reaching the end of the hour. We have three questions from the audience, so we'll take a look at them. So.
So Galita Vior asks, when do you think is the best time to perform next generation sequencing in patients with metastatic disease to, to guide their treatment? Well, uh, I think that um, as soon as the diagnostic of refractory disease is made, it has to be done. And I would say that all metastatic patients, um, it would be interesting to have it if yeah. you can have the reimbursement of uh, the genotype. Okay. But maybe Jim's, uh, Jim must have an idea on this. I, know, I agree. Yeah. The second question from Dr. Pitoya, uh, what about NTREC and RET fusion mutations? Do we have targets there? For a different yeah, I mean, the, we, we have target for NTREC and for RET and there has been clinical cases regarding with differentiation it seems to work uh, regarding redifferentiation. Now, regarding long-term treatment, whether it's related to the iodine or not, we have even less data than, than, than what we have on the BRAF and on the RAS. Um, the, the, the thing I just would say for the red rearrangement is that it's mostly in the young patients mm -hmm. with metastatic disease, which mostly are not refractory to reductive iodine. And I think that red, um, red fusion in DTC in young patients should not, uh, it, it should, should not means equal to redifferentiation because many of those patients are not refractory and have really, really long, long-term life. But the, this needs to be put in trials. Yeah. So the last question uh, from Professor Tsvas. Do you have noted, did you note uh, a difference in different sites that you see a response to radioiodine, for example, bone versus lungs versus other sites. But some sites respond better than others. We, we haven't looked uh, site by site from the study, but the feeling I have from treating the patients is that as usual, lung respond better than bone. And, and bone is different to measure response as well, right? I mean, you get the uptake, but it's very hard to measure the response. Yeah. Right. Okay, I would like to thank you both and Dr. Erkin. It was an amazingly interesting session and see you all next week. Bye. Great, thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.